the first step is to add the player object. So adding the player object is the same way that we've added other objects that exist in our library. So remembering that the object has its library linkage name here, if you take careful note of that, then we can see that. So I will shrink up my screen a little bit so we can see those while we're typing. So if I want to add my player to the stage, var player type movie clip equals. Now the file I provided, I left the import statements that we're going to need for today because that will help you out while you're code hinting. Otherwise, Flash automatically put those in for me. I did not type any of those import statements that you see. Technically, we don't need them until we take this code and put it into an external action script file, at which point they're mandatory. But right now, they're a good practice. They don't hurt anything, and they help getting you a, more accustomed to seeing what belongs there. So if I want to have my guy show up on screen, then I can say new dude because that is his linkage name. And then I'm going to add my score box. And I'm going to add my game over. So adding these objects, all it does is create their variable names. It creates their instances. We haven't positioned them. We haven't done anything about how they're going to appear on screen. That comes next. But it's a good practice while you're working on this to do this in small steps. I'm going to create these objects. I'm going to add these objects to the screen to verify that everything is working. And then I will kind of take some of that code back until I have reach that point in the game where I actually need it because we don't need game over to show up in the beginning but we will test it now and make sure it does indeed work. So I want to specify a starting position for my player. This is a somewhat arbitrary position that I've started just so he doesn't show up at 0, 0 because if I just say add child to my player without actually specifying an X and Y when I issue that command, it will just position it at 0, 0. So I would prefer to put it up at a place of my choosing. Now I can, when I'm using the same value for x and y, a shorthand method I can use is I can say my scorebox.x equals scorebox.y equals, in this case, I want to say 10. And that will effectively put my score box, my score box that I see over here, it will position it at 10 and 10. So approximately where my cursor is, that's where its registration point will show up. So that's just an easy way to fit those two lines into one. But I could have just as easily said scorebox.x equals 10, scorebox.y equals 10. But when it's the same number, that sometimes is a nice way to go. Now, for setting my game over, at this point, I don't know how big it is. I don't know where I want it. But I do know that I want it to be centered on screen based on the height and width of my game over artwork. So to do that, what I can do is I can set its x equal to the width of half of the width of the stage minus half of the width of the object. And that will actually then give me a centered position. Because if I look at the screen, half of the width of the stage is here. And then half of the width of the object would put it. So let's see, where's game over? So if I put game over here on screen, here's its registration point. So we know that I want to get it centered. So here's half of the stage and then half of the width of the object. We'll position it approximately right here on screen, allowing it to be centered. So I could take stock, put it there, look at the property, see what the X and Y is, and hard code it in. But it's nicer to do it with a relative number because if I change the size of my movie or change the size of my game over graphic, it will still be centered on screen. So this is a very common technique to use. So I type in stage dot stage width because I'm doing X 
and it automatically code hinting comes up. And now to get half of it, I could divide it by two. But flash does multiplication much faster than division. So if I times it by 0.5, it's able to execute that faster. I still prefer to use the divided by two because I think that just makes more sense to my brain than typesing by 0.5 to get it. But from a performance standpoint, Flash is much happier with this operation. So it is what it is. And then we can say game over dot with times 0 0.5. So that will now center game over horizontally. And now I can repeat that for centering it vertically using y and height value. So I'll just copy this, paste it, change x's to y, and widths to height. And now that will take my game over box and center it on screen when I need it. To verify all of this is working, I can type in add child player, add child score box, add child game over, and save, test my movie, and I should see all of my objects appear on screen. I have my player, I have my game over, and I have my score now all showing up on screen. To add in the keyboard controls requires us to tell the stage to listen for keyboard events. Because we have to tell the stage, hey, listen for a key down or a key up type of operation. So I can just simply say stage.add event listener uh, keyboard event. And once I get keyboard event typed and put in the period, it automatically gives me key down or key up. So we'll start with key down, and then I can put in my function key is down. And as always, if you don't want to use my function naming or my variable naming, feel free to change it at your own peril. Because it makes it challenging to follow along during the demonstrations. But you're always welcome to name things how you see fit. I'm okay with that. We also need to add in a stage uh, event listener for the keyboard event of key up. And we'll use the function key is up for that. Because once we tell Flash, hey, a key is being pressed, it's useful to then be able to track that and know when that particular key is let up on the keyboard. Now at this point we just need to define what those functions are going to be and how they are going to work. Doing keyboard inputs in Flash is something that there's a different a variety of different techniques that different people have used. Some more effective, some less effective, and different Flash developers will say one is superior to another. They all seem to have merits in certain situations. You have to decide which situation works best for you. So we can just simply figure out as we look at it which one it's going to be. Now first we're going to make the keys work. We're going to get Flash to tell us, hey you press this key. Then we're going to make something happen when we press that key. Namely, we'll make the player start moving around the screen. We'll make the player's shield object appear and cool things like that. So to pull this off, do a simple function definition. And the event type is going to be keyboard event because it needs to match what is in our event listener. And now I can type in what I want to have happen. Now the nice part is the key down and the key up functions 
are going to be very, very similar to each other in terms of what we need. So once we have the key down function working, we can kind of just copy paste it for the key up and change a few details and then it's going to work. So that is something that is nice to work with. Now when we're doing a keyboard event and wanting to track what's happening with it, it's important to be able to identify what key was pressed. We do that through the key code. Now most people don't have the key codes for Flash memorized right at the tip of their tongue where they can just tell you what it is and oh what's the key code for X? Well I know that because I worked with a student this morning on a project and I found out what the key code for X was. But we used a utility here in Flash of figuring it out. So if I just do a trace statement right now I could say trace the key pressed was and then do my key code. So if I trace out my key code, what's going to happen when I press the keys on the board, it's going to send me out a message and tell me what key I pressed. So if I test my, oh, but I have to, I forgot. It wants my key up function to find, so I will just put that in. I could either comment out that line number 23 for my event listener for key is up, or I'll just put it in. I just won't give it any details yet. So now, now it will work because I don't have an event listener calling a function that doesn't exist. If I press a key on the keyboard, we can see the key code for the space bar that I just pressed is 32. If I press the arrow keys, which are the very common movement keys that you would use, we'll see that the left arrow key generates a key code of 37. Up 38 right 39, down 40. If you look at the arrow keys, you'll see that's working in a clockwise circle starting with the left arrow key. 37, 38, 39, and 40. Those are probably the most common key codes that people use when they're working with Flash. The nice part is, if you forget it, it's pretty easy to write a function that generates the key code. Or, as I found out, I did a search, I said AS3 key codes. The first hit gave me a page where someone then detailed out all of the key codes for a standard keyboard. So do you have to commit it to memory? No. But for the purposes of tonight's example, we will see that 32 for space, 37, 38, 39, and 40 are the key codes that we are going to be working with because that will allow us to move our player as well as pull up our um, attack shield for taking out those pesky enemies that we're working with. So that traces out the key code. I can just comment that in case I want it for some other key code later. I'll just leave it there for the time being. The next step is to set up what would be a series of if statements. If this key is pressed, do this. If this key is pressed, do that. If this key is pressed, do something else. Now, an if statement like that, where we're taking the same event, which has a number of different parameters or possible items that it could generate, an easier way to write that if, else if, if, else if kind of logic is to use what's called a switch statement. It's in essence a shorthand way of writing if, else if, else if, else if, else if, else if until you go through all your different cases that your values could be. So it's the preferred method when you are dealing with something like this, but it you could use the if else if, it just means you have tons of curly braces and a much greater likelihood of typos occurring in your code. The switch statement is a much cleaner code that allows you to see what's going on a little bit easier. So the syntax for the switch statement is switch and then you say on what event you're checking and we're checking key code because we're dealing with this keyboard event and then I put in my curly braces 
And then we say when the case of the key code being 37, then I specify what I want to have happen. And I'm going to start out again using trace statements until I verify things are working. And I'm going to just type a little bit more here and then explain in detail what's happening. Now I have put in the word break after each case because what happens when you're doing a switch statement is it will compare the first item. So if I push the left arrow, it will trace out left. And if I did not have break, then it would go through and it would go up and it goes through and it will compare everything and then actually execute the very last action in my switch statement if any of these cases are true. Think of case or as in the situation or when that event has happened. So in the event that I press the keyboard key that generates the key code of 37, in that event, it's going to run this code. But if I don't put a break, it will actually not run that code and it'll go all the way through and run the very last option. That's just a quirk of how switch statements are. So I have to say, if this case is true, then break out of it and don't check against anything else. So a switch statement can't go, oh, this is true, and oh, wait, something else is true, oh, and something, it can only, it can only have one true value. And when it reaches that value, it stops checking. A switch statement would not be efficient if you were comparing against, say, 100 objects or 100 cases. If you had 100 cases, you don't want to have to go through 99 to find out the 100th one is true. That's not a very efficient way to kind of compute. Now, computers are so ridiculously fast now, we probably would notice the slowdown, but it's not good code. So if I'm just doing the arrow keys and spacebar, I still have three more cases that I need. So at this point, I can copy and use the magic of copy-paste. So I start out 37, left, 38, up. 39 will be right, down, space. And space was 32, down is 40, and right is 39. So knowing this, I can save it, I can run this, and I should, if I press those keys, it should now trace out only those, but not trace out anything if I press other keys on my keyboard. So if I press the left arrow, up, right, down, space, and nothing else generates any response. So if I keep pressing left, we keep seeing left occur. So the code works. So the next thing I need to do besides starting my video with the word so, which has become now I realize a crutch, a problem, someone goes through and counts all of the so's I start my videos with, I'll be very embarrassed, so please don't ever point that out to me. I'm aware that it's a personal character flaw. But what I need to do is create a variable, and we have movement in the x direction, so I will call this my x speed, and it's a number, and I'm going to start its value equal to zero because I'm not going to be moving right away. And I will have a y speed, which is of a type number equal to zero. So I now have an X speed and a Y speed that the player is going to access. And when I press the keys on the keyboard, it's going to update my X speed or my Y speed, giving me the movement that I desire without basing my movement on the key repeat rate on the keyboard because that's just a crappy way to do things because it's too unpredictable and it just doesn't give you smooth playback. Now, what I can do next is I need to then create that enter frame function. It's going to be a loop. So I can say stage.add event listener event and I will just call this loop. 
So now I have my enter frame listener in place ready for me to create my loop that's occurring. To define the loop function loop colon void curly brace because it doesn't return anything now we can say player dot x plus equals x speed. Player dot y plus equals y speed. What this means is if I run my movie right now, absolutely nothing will happen because my x speed and y speed are set to zero. If I want to make my player move, I need to now set my x speed and y speed in my switch statement. So if I press the left arrow, x speed equals minus, and I'm just going to choose an arbitrary value of 5. If I press my right arrow, x speed equals 5. So negative 5 to go left, positive 5 to go right. We can do the same thing with my y values. y speed equals uh, up is minus 5 and down would be um, positive 5. So this now sets the values. What this does not do is when I let go of a key, nothing's going to happen. So once I start moving right now in this test, it's going to keep moving. There is no stopping because I have not defined the key is up switch statements yet. That is coming very shortly. In the interest of space on screen, I am going to eliminate my trace statements here just to make it easier for me to fit more code on screen at once. So you can leave the switch. The, I would recommend you leave the trace statements or put in comments so you remember which is which. But I'm getting rid of those just so that you can see more code on screen while we're doing the demonstration. So I'm going to save this. And if I run this and start pressing the arrow keys, I should see my player running around the screen. But he will not stop running because I have not put in any commands on key is up. And I also have not done anything to take into account when he reaches the edge of the screen. He will keep going off into infinity. If I want him to wrap to a new location on screen, I will have to take that into account, which we will do shortly. If I run this, you can see I press the key and he is moving. Now I can't... Okay, I, I kind of like this gameplay where you, you can't stop your movement, so it, it adds to some of the difficulty there. That might be kind of fun gameplay to work out, that there is no key up. It doesn't slow down, and you just, once you're moving, you're going. That could be kind of fun. There's always ways to customize this or change the mechanics a little bit to create a richer gameplay experience. So to make the key ups work, all I have to do is grab this switch statement, stick it in my key up, okay, and grab it and copy it properly. Let's try again. Copy. And now change all of these values to zero. So when I let go of that particular key, it will set that x or y speed to zero. And we don't care about letting up on space because we won't need it for how we're going to make this work. So now I have all of my x speed and y speed. When I let go of the x key, then it sets x speed back to zero. If I press the up key, let go of the up key, y speeds back to zero, so it zeroes out my speed value. So now, when it runs, it behaves. And you can still move diagonally by pressing two keys at a time. 
otherwise it moves in more of a grid or tile based manner. So we're on our way to making things happen and we're using a better practice of using the speed value and updating it based on a game loop instead of updating it based just on pressing the keys. The keys just set the speed, the player updates in my loop statement. That's a nicer way to work. Now, what we can also do is take into account when the player hits the edge of the screen, it would be nice to have the player wrap to the other side asteroid style. If you remember the classic video game asteroids, when you hit one side of the screen, you reappear on the opposite side of the screen. So we can very simply pull that off, which is nice. We can do it right in the game loop, or we could make a custom function and put it in that and call that function from the game loop. But for now, we'll just keep it in the game loop because it's there. So checking for boundaries is going to be doing some if statements. We can check on my x, and then I can check on the y value to determine if I have reached the position that I want to be. So if player.x is less than 0, player.x is now equal to, and now we need to go stick the player off near the side of the screen. And I could type in a value such as one pixel less than um, the width of the stage. So if we just start out with, it now puts me, when my x goes too far left, it now puts me back at the stage width. I'm going to test this one, we'll come back to the code. So if I go over, you should see I'm wrapping. Now keep in mind that my player is registered in its top left hand corner, so it's the point that it's paying attention to is this registration dot. He's not centered, it's that registration dot, that's what that's what number Flash is aware of. It's part of this. So when I have gone too far left, so the moment I start to go off screen it puts me back at the edge. And then at this point We can check, or if my x is greater than, so if I have now moved all the way off screen, we can reset my position to zero. So now we can see it goes all the way over. So we're now creating a decent illusion. It's not perfect, there's some fine tuning we could do, but for the purposes of this demonstration it works pretty well. Now we can do the same thing using Y's and stage height instead of stage width to take care of that. So I'm going to let you work on that yourself. Time has come to add our opponent to the game. The first place that we're going to start with that is going to be creating a container to hold the enemies. We need to make a box, if you will, to hold that we put all the enemies into. Because we won't know how many enemies our game has created. I'm not creating it out of a fixed 
batch of enemies. I may have 10, I may have 1,000 by the time, I, well, no, you've watched me play games before, I'll never have 1,000, maybe 100. But we don't know. And what we need to do is be able to figure out how to deal with those enemies. So what we do is we utilize a movie clip as a box, a containing object to put those enemies into. So with this, I'm going to make an enemy container. And it's just going to be a new movie clip. Now this enemy container, it's not linked to any object in my library. It doesn't have any inherent artwork, but I'm going to stick the enemies into it. And then I can, with one fell swoop, I could say, remove child enemy container, and boom, all the enemies would disappear in one shot, which is kind of cool. Um, we don't have, I kind of like having the game end where you can see all the enemies still on screen showing how pathetic you were when they do take you out. I kind of enjoy that part of the game with it, but we'll see. So I've added my enemy container as a variable. Now I need to add that enemy container onto the screen. So I need to put an add child. I'm going to say add child enemy container. Now when I add actual enemies, I will say enemy container dot add child instead of just simply add child. That will then make the enemy objects children of my enemy container. So the enemy container is simply a box to hold all the enemies. It has no inherent, it doesn't have color, it doesn't, it's just an empty shell, a container, a folder, and a box to put things into. So I want my game to spawn out enemies on some random basis. So we will recycle our random logic that we've used on previous projects and put that in. So I could put all of the logic for spawning an enemy directly inside my loop function. I prefer to put it into its own function. I like the word spawn, it just has this kind of sinister sound to it for creating the enemies. I could make my function called create enemy, but spawn just sounds cooler. Spawn. Maybe because the comic book influenced me way back as the original one was good. By issue 10 it should have been retired, but that's okay. It still had pretty artwork for a couple issues, and then it went downhill. And it never figured out a story. But that's all right. Comic books don't need a story if they're pretty. So now I have my spawn function and I get to define how it works or what it's going to do. So to use my random number procedure that we've used in the past, I'm going to simplify it into one line of code instead of using a temporary number variable and things like that. So I'll consolidate it a little bit because I feel that you're ready for that, but also I feel it's just less typing. The less typing, less likely to make errors. It's not quite as human readable, but you're less likely to make errors on the typing, and I think that outweighs anything at the moment. So I'm going to say my spawning chance is out of 20. So if I round down my random number times 20, and when that is equal to zero, then I will want to create an enemy. So math.floor, math.random times 20, double equal sign, zero. Double equal sign is a comparison operator. A single equal sign is an assignment operator. Assignment meaning, x equals 5. That a single equal sign sets it equal to it. x double equals 5 would be is x equal to 5. You'd be asking the question. 
So a double equal sign is a question. A single equal sign sets the value. That's how to keep those two straight. And you will find that if you take a break from programming for a while and then come back to it, when you do an if statement, you almost always forget to add the second equal sign and you'll wonder why your code isn't working. Because if you say variable equals something, that's always true. Because you're saying this equals this. You're setting it. Therefore, that's a true statement. So your conditional always runs as true. And you'll bang your head up against the wall, cursing it, saying, what is wrong? Why is this not checking it correctly? And then you remember you forgot the extra equal sign. Happens to me all the time. So I would suspect I'm not alone in that venture. So now I want to create a new enemy. So now I can say var enemy equals new enemy. And if I say enemy container dot add child enemy, that now sticks this enemy into its parent container. And at that point, the enemy is now on screen. What I also need to do is to decide where I want my enemy to originally appear. Currently, this code will put the enemy at 0, 0 top left hand corner of the screen. If I want it to appear somewhere else, I need to specify that now. Now, if the enemies always appear in the same spot, I run into the challenge right now when the enemies aren't moving of being able to see if I'm creating more than one enemy. So I could at least give it a random value for now and maybe we'll leave it at that or see how we want to modify our game later. So a random value will times it by 200 with a starting value of 75. So what that means is my enemies are going to appear somewhere between 75 and 275 for their y position. Because I, instead of being a number between 0 and 200, it's between 0 and 200 plus 75, which gives me a starting value of 75, a maximum value of 275. So at this point, we should see the right-hand side of the stage get littered with enemies on a fairly regular basis, approximately one per second. And if you haven't done so recently, save, and then you can test your movie, and you'll see the enemies are starting to all appear. What the enemies aren't doing is the enemies aren't moving yet. They're not chasing me yet. They're just staying put. The next step will be to modify, or not modify, but add to the code to make the enemies update their position based on where I am on screen. So we play a nice little game of chase, which is a whole lot of fun. To deal with these enemies, these enemies that don't have any particular unique name. They're just the enemy objects inside my enemy container. What I am going to do is make a generic temp enemy object. It has no value. It, it, I'm just setting aside a chunk of memory for it. Doing so means I don't have to recreate that temp enemy variable every time I loop through my enemy container. So if I have two objects in my enemy container, I loop through it twice. If I have 20, I loop through it 20 times. That's what I'm going to do. That's how it works. So 
what we need to do is to make these temp enemies we need to have them chase our player so the first step create my kind of holding variable inside my loop I'm going to have an update enemy function so this will now update my enemies and I could call it update enemies I suppose but I like enemy better function update enemy and now what I need to do is to loop through all of the enemies inside my enemy container now this part if you're not used to programming you will have to take it on faith in the beginning as you grow more accustomed to it it will start to make more sense what we're going to use is what's called a for loop a for loop says for each of these objects as long as a certain property is not true so until or until this property is true keep looping through so what we're going to say is for and once I say for then I can say I create a counter object a iterator variable and it's an integer it's a whole number and we get to set it equal to something now there's two ways to typically rifle through these objects one way is to start at the bottom we say give me object zero move object zero check for collisions blah 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 then give me the object in position one then the object in position two object in position three and keep working our way through the list the other way is say give me the object at the end of the line and then work down until I hit the, item at the object at the bottom. Uh, in more advanced interactives, it becomes more critical to start at the top and work your way down to zero. So that's the method that we're going to show because otherwise, if you start at the bottom and then you take out an object in the middle, then the value of how far you are going to loop through is now out of bounds because you eliminated something in the middle but if you're working your way down if you get rid of something along the way it doesn't affect anything below it it's kind of imagine that each of these objects these enemies we're looping through are a tower of blocks if we start at the top and work our way down if we take one out it doesn't affect the ones below but if we start at the bottom as we're working our way up if we pull one out all the ones on top topple over. So that's why we prefer to start from the top and work our way down through the list. 75% um, of the time if you start at the bottom work your way up you won't notice a difference but then periodically you'll have unexplained bugs occur in your program and you're like what is going on why isn't this working and then you go on the forums and you start looking for errors and you start rewriting all your code and it's just simply because you've grabbed an object out causing all the objects on top to topple over and then you can't figure out why they're not there anymore you're like why is it not working so we're gonna start from the top and work our way down so enemy container has a property uh, at this point I need to make my window a little bit bigger here it has a property of how many children it has so every time I add an enemy to enemy container that gives it a child. So I can say how many children does it have? So I'm going to set i equal to the number of children in my enemy container. Then I'm going to say as long as i is greater than zero and then we'll have i 
go down. So if there's two objects in enemy container, then what it does is it will start out at two and progressively work its way down. Then it will be one. And then when we get, there's no more objects because i is now zero, then i greater than zero no longer holds true so it stops going through the loop. So what this for loop does is it starts out with a value, that var i, and then as long as that value is greater than zero, it runs the code that will follow. Each time it goes through the loop, i decreases by one. That's the basic operation that's in place here. Now, the variable temp enemy that we created earlier, we're going to give that a value now. And we say it's equal to enemy container. And now we can say get child at and we say at this point i minus 1. And I will explain that in a moment. And we have to tell it we want to get that object as a movie clip. So this is, we have to tell Flash we want to populate temp enemy with the child object at position i minus 1. The first object in enemy container is at position 0, the next one at 1, 2, 3. So this allows us to grab the object at that position. Remembering that if there's two objects in enemy container, the number of children is 2. So if we said get an object at 2, the position of the second object is actually at 1. So the position is always kind of 1 less than how many objects are in it because computers start counting at zero but when we ask for how many objects well that has to be a positive number if any objects exist. It's a little mental gymnastics here when I was building the example I botched it periodically when I was working on the code here by forgetting the minus one part so take it on faith accept it and go with it. Now what we need to do is to make the objects chase after our player. So we need to find out is the object, I mean we could start out simply, I mean the way I have it set up in the original example is it closes the distance, the greatest distance first. So when an object appears, it moves the greatest distance away first. So if it, the distance is greater x than y, the difference of our positions, it will move in an x manner. If the distance between the objects is greater y than x, it will start moving in a y movement to try and figure out. I mean, it, and you can work out whatever logic works for your type of thing. If we only want to move x, then at that point we can say something along the lines of if temp enemy dot x is greater than player dot x temp enemy dot x and now we need to, if the enemy's x is bigger than the player's x, that means it's to the right, the player's to the left, so we need to move left to get closer to the player, so that's a minus direction, minus equals, and if I move the enemy slower than the player, it gives the player some chance, otherwise we're in a world of hurt. But we know that if if the x is 
not, so if this conditional is not true, then at that point we know that we should just add to instead of subtract to. Because it's either going to be one or the other. It's either going to be to my right or to my left. So I don't have to do another if. I can just say else temp enemy dot x plus equals two. So if the enemy's x is larger than the player's x, I need to subtract from its x to try and make them more equal. But if that's not the case, then that means my x, the player, must be bigger than the enemy, so we need to add to its x. That's the logic at work here. If I run this, we can see that they're now chasing after me, but if I move over here, you can see they start coming back. So we'll wait till they get close, and I run over here and see how they're all coming back. Oh, that's kind of fun. They're now all forming into a line, and now you can see they're vibrating plus two minus two plus two minus two plus two minus two, and they, they're getting really beat up there. Now if I want to add to the challenge of the game, there's my x. Now I could change x's to y's. So now they're going to chase me from all directions, which means I'm fairly well screwed at this point. So just change the x's to y's. And as soon as they come, you can see where, yeah, I'm pretty well. If I don't get my shield it up in operation, I'm, I'm going to be uh, hurting pretty bad here. So we're making progress. The objects are chasing me. And they're looking pretty mean about it, too. going to hold off on the making it decides whether it moves more x or more y first. We'll just leave it at that in the interest of time. We'll probably come back to that concept next week. To check the collisions, we're going to use what we used previously last week of hit test object. That measures effectively the bounding box, the rectangle, rectangular box that would enclose the artwork. So if I state if temp enemy dot hit test object player. So if that is true, when you're doing a conditional statement, you don't have to say if something equals true. If I just state the thing I want. That's the same as stating true like this. That's just how conditionals work in almost every programming language. You just say if the statement that you want to be true and then if it is then it will run what comes next. Now at this point I could make my game end and make it really difficult so that would be something I could do. Now if you remember, we created that game over object early on. Technically we don't need to be seeing it yet because we don't want to see game over when the whole process starts. It would make more sense to say add child game over when we get run when one of the bad guys runs into us. To me that makes more sense. So I am going to remove my game over statement from my initial collection of bad childs. So I'll just cut it. Go into this section, and now I can paste it in. So that now would put game over on screen. To make the game stop, so that the enemies stop moving, I stop moving, what I need to do is I need to then specify that some event listeners are no longer being listened for and then that will stop them executing. So key down or key is down set speed equal to a certain value key up 
sets it up. And even if I don't do those, the big one is I need to stop listening for loop. So we're just going to start with that first. But a good practice would be to remove the other. So I copied that. I will paste it in. So to remove an event listener, we use the line exactly as we added it, but we changed the word add to remove. Whenever you're putting in remove event listener statements, I recommend you copy paste your add event listener and just change the add to a remove versus typing the whole thing from scratch. That's a really good way to introduce typos in your code and then you get frustrated about why it's not working. So at this point, if an enemy hits me, fires off game over, and it removes the event listener. So I'm going to save in case it crashes. I want it saved first. Now I can test it. And now here they come and boom. Game stopped. It's ignoring my keyboard input. And my game over then appeared on screen. So testing again. They're chasing me. Whoop, game over. So it works. Game over shows up. Gameplay stops because loop stops executing. It's a pretty straightforward system in that regard. I want my shield to appear, so I'm no longer going to trace out that I push the spacebar. I'm using key code 32, spacebar, to make my shield appear. And I'm going to call a function called shield up. Based on my previous Star Trek reference, I should say shields up, and it would just sound better as part of it. But we only have one shield, so we'll say shield up. And now I need to define what that function is. Now you may notice I keep putting my functions above my key is up and key is down functions. That's a very common thing that you typically bury those at the bottom of your code because once you have those in, you rarely have to go back to them. So often you just keep those at the end and start putting all your other functions above it. And next week we will really talk about the sequence and organizing of your functions so that you have much cleaner and more usable code. The nice part is once you get a basic framework of how to organize your code, you can make a variety of projects, whether it's keyboard input, mouse input, other things and you follow the same basic template. So what we're learning isn't unique or specific to this one project but is starting to lay the groundwork, the framework for creating a more complex project. You're making a template where you just change the artwork, change some of the specifics and now you have a new project. So it's not something that you have to reinvent the wheel each and every time while you work. So now I will define out function shield up now what I want to have happen at this point is I want to add my shield object to my uh, to my player so what I can say is var shield equals new and uh, let's verify that naming the linkage name is shield so say create a new shield and we're going to attach it to player so we just say player add child shield Now, this will put the shield object on my project so that it's ready to, it will play when I hit space. Now, if I test my movie, if I hit space, we can see the shield's here until they run into me. Because currently, they still affect me, but you may notice they now affected me when they hit my shield. So we're going to have to modify some things a little bit and make it so that when they run into the shield they get destroyed and my score goes up instead of me getting creamed every time. So that's going to be 
next part. But the first part is making sure the shield shows up. Then we will go back and make sure that the shield is timed so the shield only shows up for a little bit and then it disappears. Because if the shield stays up indefinitely, there's no challenge in the game and I'm just a hostile object running everybody over and racking up an infinite score. Which might be a nice cheat because I suck at my video game so I might as well put some of those back doors in the system. So this adds the shield. So what we need to modify now is when we're checking on the collisions. So currently it's checking for did I hit player but what we need to do is I want to make it so not when we hit the player because player now has kind of grown to include the shield but we only want the player object so because when we said player add child shield players boundary its bounding box effectively grew but we only want the bounding box for the player object. So what we can do is we can change it to player.getChild at zero. Now what that will do is that will grab the player object at position zero, which is the original player because when I add the shield, the shield's at position one because the shield, when we say add child, it puts it at one. If we had a second shield and said add child, it would put it at position two. So the player is position zero, it's the root object. So now if I test this, we'll see that it does indeed, they have to get all the way in to touch me for it to register the hit and do game over. So we're getting the original player, that's what this statement says. Now that player is effectively two objects instead of one. So that's if they hit me, or player, but now we want to know if the temp enemy hits the player so if now if they hit the player that means they're hitting the shield and we can first start out and just update the score we haven't played with score yet. We don't even have a score variable yet. So we probably are going to have to go back and add that because if I want my score to go up, I need to have a score to go up. I have a score field. And we'll take a look at that and how it's constructed momentarily, taking a break from the code. So if I look at my score box, the score box movie clip, so it says the score box movie clip is a text field that has a name of MSG, not the magic spice, but MSG, short for message. So that's the name of it. It's classic text, dynamic text. That way I don't get that annoying message with the TLF text and it needs to make the extra uh, Swiss file to go with the whole thing and it's just big and annoying. Classic text, dynamic text, instance name MSG, and I have embedded my font so that I will have the necessary characters. So my embedded font, I embedded the uppercase, lowercase numbers and punctuation so I can be lazy and not have to worry about what characters I'm sending to my message box here. So I have to embed the font. I have to give that text box an instance name, classic text, dynamic text. If I do all of that, then I can now change its message on it. What I prefer to do at this point would be to say score plus equals one. That now increases my score variable that I have to then go back and create because I haven't made it yet. So we'll scroll up to our variables. It's very standard practice in coding. 
After your import statements, then you do your variables, then you start setting properties and listing your functions. You don't want to list your variables at the end. If you list a variable after a function that needs it, you will get an error message because it reads the code top to bottom. So if the function needs a variable, but that variable shows up after the function, it can't access it. So that's why we always do variables first. So I'll start out my score at zero. So now my score starts going up every time my shield hits one of the bad guys. Var score type number equals zero. Now, when they hit, I update my score, but it makes more sense. I could update the score here, but it doesn't really make sense to update a different object inside a function. So like my update enemy function really shouldn't be updating the text in my score box. That's, that would be kind of considered bad form or bad manners. It would work, the code would be fine, no error messages, work 100% of the time. But it's bad manners because update enemies can update a variable such as, hey, look, you know, the score went up, but it shouldn't be updating a separate object. It shouldn't be saying, hey, score box, up, you know, here, I want your words to say this now. That's just bad manners. So we could have an update score function, or I can say, scorebox.msg.text equals score colon space close quote plus score. So remembering that my score starts out at zero. So now I'm updating this. Every time I hit an enemy, my score goes up by one. Now one thing that we probably should do is after we hit an enemy, we should probably get rid of them so our score doesn't start going up because otherwise they'll keep touching us the whole time and then I'll just see my score climb ridiculously fast, which I guess isn't really a bad thing since I you know, do so poorly anyway. We might as well. Oh, wait, no, but game over is taking effect first. So, oh, let's see. Let me try again. I forgot. I have to turn on my shield of death. And then they touch me, so they still keep moving. I got six before it touched me. If I was really careful, I might be able to like keep him right in my shield the whole time and then score up before they run into me, but I'm not that good. So we should make the enemies disappear. Once the score goes up, the enemy should go bye-bye. To get rid of the enemy, we have to use our remove child syntax. So it's enemy container dot remove child temp so we tell the parent to remove the child so we tell temp enemies parent hey get rid of it and that removes it from that container doing so removes it from the display list so it no longer shows up on screen. So enemy container dot remove child temp enemy. We can see oh that's right. There's no timer here so I can just sit here forever now and keep racking up points. I'm kinda liking this. But you know it's just not really it's not really a fair game. Those enemies have no chance now. They're chasing me, but they have no chance. So I need to time out my shield, and then maybe put a delay before I can reactivate that shield. And that's what we can look at next. The variables that we're going to need to add to make this take place are, we need timer objects. We're going to want two timer objects. There's a number of ways we could go about this, but I, 
I like the simplicity of using two. So I'm going to have a shield timer and its object of type timer equals and it's going to be a new timer and now if we notice the code hinting is telling me what I want my delay to be so how frequently do I want the timer to fire off and then how many times do I want it to repeat if I put a repeat of zero it will run forever and never complete itself so if I want a timer just to run until I tell the timer to stop by actually saying timer object dot stop because timers have pr methods of start and stop so if I tell it to stop I can tell it to stop I can tell it to reset I can do any number of things but if I give it a number of times I want it to run it will run that many times so first my delay delays are measured in milliseconds so how long do I want it to run so I want my shield to be on screen for two seconds that matches the length of the audio file that's in the library that we'll be using a little bit later for it so two seconds would be two thousand milliseconds and I wanted to run one time so I put comma one now I need a second timer and this timer is oh it's not shield timer this time it's going to be my my res reset shield timer or I could call it my charge up timer or whatever I want it to be so I, I can do it uh, whatever name makes me happy now I want to have both timers start at the same time this one is going to run for four seconds so that means my shield will be up for two seconds my shield reset timer or my reset shield timer will run for four seconds now I need to set my event listeners for these timers sorry not stage shield timer dot add event listener now the code hinting because I defined the variable first the code hinting has been really useful and it's telling me the one I want which is timer complete and now with this it's shield timer complete and again you can name it whatever you want my reset shield timer add event listener and sometimes code hinting isn't very generous and did not help me out here but that happens so there's my reset timer complete and now I need to define those two functions and we are also going to need one final variable to work with these timers because the timers are here and now we need to take advantage of a programming construct called a boolean it's a variable or object that has two values true or false that's what a boolean is it's a very common thing because think of it as a light switch a light switch is on or off it has two values unless you have a dimmer on it and that's a whole separate ball game but for a standard switch it's on or off a boolean is true or false so effectively what we're going to be tracking is is my shield on or is it off and when it's on or when it's not on that means my shield is ready to be fired or to turn be turned on and when it's not ready 
then then it's not going to be ready. So, and that did not come out at all very eloquent, but such is life. It doesn't always work. So I'm just going to create a variable, type boolean, and that means my shield is ready to be used. Now I could name it shield ready if I wanted to tie it into this whole shield set of values. But it's the end of the night and my typing skills are dwindling quickly. So I'm going to have to keep things short. So to recap, I have a boolean called ready and it's currently set to true. I have my shield timer, my reset shield timer, and I have my event listeners for those two timers, listening for when they are done. So that is now going to be the basis for making the rest of this happen. Due to popular request and better coding practice, it would make sense to rename this as reset shield timer underscore complete so that we can make a better correspondence between those two, between the variable object and this function. So it makes a greater connection between them. So that would be a better practice to engage that. So my laziness was called out in public and that's okay. I'm fine. I'm not overly you know, distraught about that whole part. Now, I have all my pieces in place and now I just need to work on implementing these into the rest of my code. Previously under shield what ended up happening with the shield is it automatically went up. Well we don't need it to automatically go up. We only want it to be able to be activated when ready is true. Because if the shield's not ready, we don't want to activate it. So I need to now take under inside my shield up function, I need to wrap it in a conditional. I need to say if ready is true, then create the shield. And now, what we can do is say at this point, now ready equals false, because now it's my shield is up, so I won't be ready to do it again. And now I can say timer.start. reset shield, start both timers. So then it's ready to, so both timers will start. Ready has now been reset, both timers will start. And now I need to define what I want to have happen when those timers go off. And there's a whole lot of uh, typing to get that instantiated. But effectively, function shield timer complete, e colon timer event, colon void, curly brace, close curly brace. And before I add any other, then I will have my reset shield timer as well. So now I have those two roughed in and I need to specify what needs to happen. So when the shield timer fires, that it's done. So the timer is clicking off, and when it hits two seconds, it broadcasts out a message and says, hey, guess what, I'm complete. When that happens, this function will execute, and this function will then simply say, player 
dot remove child and we don't actually know the name of it but we do know that the shield itself is in position one. Remembering that within player when we add a shield the shield is in position one, the original player graphic is in position zero. It's the same knowledge we used under our hit detection under hit test object where we said get child at here that's the original player's player the object at zero the object at one is the shield so we say hey get rid of the shield that removes the shield so that it won't protect us any longer the next thing that we can do is in the reset which fires off after four seconds ready is now reset back to true so when the shield timer is up it removes the shield when the reset timer is up it allows me to be able to add the shield again because currently if I hit the space bar it just calls shield up hitting space bar has no idea whether shield is ready or not it doesn't care it just sends out a message hey space was pressed calls this function then my shield up function checks to see if ready is true if so creates a new shield adds it starts the timers when the timers are up removes the shield when the resets up it makes me capable of showing a shield again. Now to test it, one, two, gone, and now I can hit it. But now when it goes away, it <coughs> takes a while to come back. So at this point, we now have the timers firing off. When they are done, they can remove objects or change values. So there, a timer event is just like a keyboard event just like an enter frame event, just like a mouse event. These are all events that when they fire they call a function and then we define what that function is.